Yeah, a warm welcome. I mean, literally to everyone out there, wherever you are. Not everyone actually happens to be in a fortunate, a fortunate destination these days and, and um, actually enjoying warm, sunny weather. So as I said, I is actually located in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, currently actually freezing from a cold front actually going through Europe. And um, yeah, and in particular also testing the, the resilience of those South Africans who have actually decided to go to countries um, over here and, and, and relocate. So yeah, as I said, a warm welcome to everybody. Good to see you again. Um, quite a few uh, familiar faces. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, over here as well, David. Um, first snow, so I, um, I delivered against my promise when we actually relocated about a year ago, actually showing our kids a little bit of snow, which they didn't know yet in their um, short life. So um, a warm welcome in particular to our three presenter or presenter teams, I should rather say. Um, if I actually may start actually with uh, the ladies first, I'd like to actually um, say hello and welcome um, Julie and, uh, and Naomi, um, two esteemed um, colleagues from Exigent Group who will actually take us through risk management today, um, followed by um, also two very esteemed and valued colleagues, um, actually from Frankfurt, um, Sebastian and Yasmin from um, Baker McKenzie and uh, reInvent Law respectively. And uh, CJ and Castro actually from SMP Global will, will actually um, kick off today's session. Um, he's actually based in is it correct in New York, CJ? That's correct. Well, Jersey, I'm across oh, Jersey. Oh, sorry, this is the usual. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like to be specific. We, yeah. We're not even going into that debate. We just actually say <laughs> you're New York and, and uh, surrounding area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My office is still there, we think, so yeah. Is it good? So a uh, warm welcome to you as well, and thanks actually for actually uh, joining us today. So without further ado, um, Let's just actually um, dive right into actually the topic and yours actually CJ in particular is about change management and understanding also that you later on have to yeah, um, cope and, and deal with your responsibilities as the clock actually LPM committee chair. So um, we're very keen to first of, all, first of all actually hear from you what your insights are and um, the floor is yours. I, a sort of allocated co-host, right? So if you want to actually present any slides, um, okay, feel free to do so. Okay, cool. So uh, first off, uh, I want to begin by thanking Inyaz and, and, and for putting me and, and getting me involved with this and, and a small plug for Aileen for putting us in contact. Um, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, being involved in the, the clock committee as a co-chair and um, it's it's an exciting opportunity to, to both be involved in that group and get insight from all the folks that are involved there, uh, but then also to, to be involved here and, and, and talk a little bit about change management, obviously write about it in the book. Um, so I'm extremely excited to, to be more specific about legal project management, but change management. Um, so before I do a little bit about myself, I'm a, I'm a legal project manager, as and yeah, as mentioned, uh, with S&P Global. So it's a large uh, enterprise level legal department, um, and we support the market intelligence sales organization. So before joining S&P Global, my experience was primarily in the fin financial services and procurement, accounts payable, payment operations areas. So as part of S&P Global, I've been able to launch uh, a large or a mid-sized uh, uh, project management office uh, within the legal department and, and it includes you know, spearheading the framework and methodology to align our key del um, deliverables and strategic objectives. And I've had some, my successful project integration span several functions, including technology, privacy, uh, data management, and contract operations, um, both with the common uh, objective of streamlining and proactively improving our operational workflows. So uh, to be a little bit more specific, I sit within the operations organization of the, of the large legal department, um, but my uh, span uh, is really beyond, uh, beyond the operations side and, and hopefully facilitate better change and, and project level uh, deliverables within the, the, the entire organization. Um, so I believe that the project management principles apply no matter the industry. My experience uh, varies. I'm, I'm fairly, uh, you know, about two years within legal project management. So um, I think that it, it's 
project management is, is project management, but I think once you get into the details, um, you you learn more about how that applies to to, to legal. Um, so if you take any way, anything away from the, the chapter that I've written, um, it's that change management is a crucial part of legal project management and, and the entire life cycle. Um, so it's not just from, you know, start, uh, you know, hey, here's, here's a project we're delivering, here's what it's about, and then that's it, right? It's, it's, it's the entire workflow. And it's, not, and it's not, hey, at the end, look what, look what we've done now, you know, you're going to have to do this, this is part of your role now, or this is what's changed and, and good luck. Um, so being proactive to change management uh, prepares stakeholders and organizations for organizational change, and it often comes in the form of a project or a legal project. So um, hopefully that's a good outline of where my direction is and where I've uh, directed the, the chapter, um, but it's important to also know who's responsible, uh, when it should be used, where it's necessary, and why it's done. Um, and and the, I guess the theme that I've um, stuck on is that change management is led by the project manager, um, that it's something of, of importance to them as they lead through a legal project. And it's relevant to all stakeholders, whether you're a part of the project team, uh, you know, the close-knit team, or you're uh, just a stakeholder that's impacted by the, by the project. You're, you know, you're gonna have a new task or activity that you're gonna have to perform as part of your job and uh, BAU activity. So, it requires a lot of collaboration, a lot of emotional intelligence and flexibility. Um, most, as I'm a project manager, many of you I believe are, so sometimes we have our scope and we don't wanna change it. We, we, you know, we know what we're trying to achieve and hey, if anybody gets in the way, then you know, there's gonna be hell to pay. So um, be, having that ability to be, be emotionally intelligent, understand your stakeholders, be flexible is important. Um, and we'll get a little bit into, into detail and you'll see in the chapter as well just about that. And then when it should be used, um, it, it should be used all the time. I think, you know, we, we, we often, I think, and I mentioned earlier is that it's, it's either used at the end or the beginning, we're not at all. Um, so change management is, is necessary um, it, because it leads to a new way and a different way of working and it should be a part of the project life cycle. Um, and then where is it necessary? Um, it's necessary uh, and applicable to all, all stakeholders, again, in your project team, externally, outside your project team, outside of your department or your organization. Um, as I mentioned earlier, as part of my role, we support a sales organization. We make changes to the contract life cycle. We make changes as to how we uh, negotiate contracts and how we engage with our, our sales reps and sales organization. Those are changes that have to be dealt with and done in a proper way and communicate, which we'll go to a little bit later. And those are our external stakeholders that have to be involved in our processes. And then why is it done? Um, most organizations are resistant to change. People are resistant to change. Um, and it needs to be a systematic change management process and it's necessary for us to adapt new processes and new ways of working. Um, so hopefully that gives you a high level understanding of, of just where the direction is of change management here and, and where it is in the legal project management space. Uh, I don't know any as if you if it's possible to open for questions or people have other comments they want to bring up. I know this is an open session. Um, Exactly. Yeah, this is um, everyone is actually invited to um, just share comments, experiences, um, questions. I mean, obviously, the um, experiences may differ. I mean, based on, on, the, on the size of legal operations, also, whether you're actually um, operating from an in-house department's perspective or, or as a next service provider. So, um, but I think we've we've actually convened all different angles today. So since we don't, I mean, you don't need to raise the hand, just actually speak up and unmute yourself. I mean, I'm, Naomi, you're the one actually sure. over to you. Sure. Uh, Christopher, that was such a great um, introduction about change management. It is so crucial. I just wanted to make a point where I have seen 
some of the most successful projects. So the project that was led through all the different phases done within budget, within scope, really fail because of their change management component. And I've seen that both from a, you know, from a legal project management perspective, as well as from my previous roles in other organizations, because you are so right, it's people that we're dealing with. And you could have the best process, the best technology, but if people are not adopting it and they don't want to change it, then you might as well not even start the project in the first place. Absolutely, that's a great point, yeah. Yeah, it spans across any type of project. And I don't want to go in that direction because this is, you know, about legal project management, but it does. It, it does, um, you know, impact um, a, a large, you know, large amount of people and then people, right? Uh, that's the key, as you mentioned. So, um, but I, I want to talk about it more in like, a, a, I guess, a normal sense, like, everyone here has a birthday and, you know, they ha you have a birthday party, right? And, and uh, you know, as part of that, you're, um, you, you want to decide who's coming to the party, right? It's your birthday. You want to have friends, you want to have family. So this is really identifying your stakeholders. And, and it's a crucial input to what, um, it, when you're looking at a project and when you're looking at change management from the start, you need to think about who's there and who wants to be, you know, who's involved with your project team who's gonna be impacted, who's going to really not have much impact, maybe just needs to be in the know. Um, and as part of my chapter, I put in tools uh, necessary to, to identify those stakeholders and identify who really has more skin in the game than, than another. Um, so when the way I look at it is a, is a, is a birthday party, right? You're the, you're the main stakeholder, you're the, the birthday boy or girl, right? And then you, you know, have friends and family that would would come and then what's their role there? What, you know, you've identified who's coming, but who's, you know, who's, uh, who's gonna be handling the gifts, who's going to be uh, putting the candles on the cake, who's making the cake, who's, you know, who's there. So those tools um, are, are crucial to that. And I use that just brief example because um, it's, everyone kind of has a better understanding, you know, who's the bringing the balloons and who those stakeholders are that are gonna, gonna be there. So. It's important to think about that input when you go into a project and when you go into change management because that will help you work through the enablement plan and, and how change is going to be delivered to those stakeholders. Um, because you telling the person who's going to uh, do the, you know, you know, put the candles on the cake that the balloons are outside doesn't really help them, right? They're more concerned about where the candles are in the drawer. So, um, you know, having a, an understanding of your stakeholders as the input in, in change management is, is, in, is extremely important. Um, and with that in mind, um, as I alluded to, you have the change enablement plan and uh, I have a graphic, I, I won't pull it up, but uh, which, which basically outlines following the input, um, the communication, the training, the transition and the support structure that's need that needs to be enabled for your stakeholders to eventually accept that change and move on uh, to a more BAU activity, whether it's during the project, maybe through testing and, and UAT testing or things that they're involved with, uh, or it's, it's after the project's done and gone, it's ended, and uh, they're now responsible for those new activities or tasks. So um, these elements require uh, various activities and tasks to prepare them for change. Um, it's, it's, I, I want to quickly touch on also com uh, communication really first, um, and communication is extremely broad. We we talk about communication. I know it's a a topic for uh, these forums as well, um, but it's it's it needs to be more specific. I think we we say, hey, let's communicate out. Let's tell someone that something's happening. Let's tell these stakeholders that change is happening. But it needs to be conveyed in the proper message. It needs to come from the proper channel. Um, specifically, uh, in my experience with my organization, that was actually the first thing that I implemented was a, was a communication process. Uh, we did not have one. We forwarded emails. We, um, you know, used word of mouth. We had, uh, you know, we had our sites and our hubs, but it wasn't managed properly. There wasn't a process around it. So as part of that, we put in a change, uh, a change management, but communication, uh, plan, uh, which enabled us to succinctly communicate to our users in a standardized form. Uh, if we did a targeted email, it was done through a proper communication channel. It had a, here's what's happening. Here's what 
uh, is changing and here's what it means to you and where you can direct for questions. So that standardization and knowledge uh, share helps users uh, adapt to change and helps them through the process. And you can use this as part of your project delivery uh, within, the, within the kickoff. Here's what's happening. Here's, here's how it impacts you here if you have questions or if you wanna be involved with how the project is uh, executed. So I wanted to touch on that because um, it's been something that's been successful within my experience within my larger organization is that the communication lines are open. We're very transparent about change and projects that are happening within the organization. And it allows people to have a better understanding uh, of what's going on within the organization that's, as often it becomes siloed work. We know that something's happening or we don't know until the project's actually been delivered that something's happened. So, um, I wanted to point that out as something of, of importance and it all leans into timing and planning. Um, and, you know, if you're prepared for those communications, you're prepared as to how, you know, how long your project's going to be from, for the most part, based on your budget and scope, you know, uh, you know, the timeline for delivery and when it's expected. Uh, so why not plan out your communication and change management plan during that process? Um, and then I do wanna talk about another example, but I, I'll open the floor for more questions. And, and if people have examples of, of communication that they've seen or uh, areas of communication where it's, it's important and, and change, um, again, I'll open the floor. Any, any comments? I know, Anna, you're gonna talk about the, um, the topic next time and in more depth, actually just looking at communication. Cool. Yes, I will. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm, I thank you very much for mentioning how important communication is. And I'm communicating yeah. right now with my dog, Barry, about this project going out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested to join the next session and, and hear from you as well, Anna. So that's awesome. Um, so uh, I, as you've kind of heard through my discussion, it, it change management can be a little tedious. Um, as a project manager, you wanna, you wanna be a, a, you know, a control of what actually the deliverable looks like and what the, the, um, that new process or new system, new tool is gonna be and, and change management often falls to the wayside. Um, so uh, it's, it's important that um, you think about where that, uh, you think about that as a main deliverable or main requirement as you work through the project and you build out your scope and scale. Um, best-in-class legal departments um, don't often have that setup of a legal project manager or in that mindset they have, may have attorneys or operational folks that are involved. So to think through that um, holistically throughout the department is often a hard and tedious task to do so. So some organizations and specifically mine have stood up more operational related teams. And then as part of that, as I mentioned, I set up a PMO. So the focus and priority that's that's given for legal project management is always there and the change management enablement is is known right and then people know that when a project comes there's going to be change involved they're going to be informed they're going to be notified they're going to be involved in the process if it, if it impacts them for the least they're going to be informed so um, with that in mind um, i want to give an example of it's specifically related to my organization um, and we support, uh, the legal team supports, our service delivery model is supporting the sales organization uh, with contract negotiation um, and other matters outside more related to risk and um, uh, litigation, financials, privacy, m &A, so those types of things. But I'll, I'll break it down just to the, the, the sales organization and, and contract negotiation. So we um, provide guidance as we enter into client relationships. Uh, we have a, a very operational delivered service delivery model where requests come in through Salesforce and we have an opportunity to negotiate the contracts with the, um, with the, with the uh, client as well as the sales rep back and forth and, and handle those requests through our legal team and eventually uh, build the relationship with the client. Um, but uh, change management is a crucial function there because there's so many different stakeholders, there's so many different moving parts and it's, a, it's various workflows and processes that are involved in that that simple delivery. Um, so it's important that change management becomes sustained, a sustained function, um, and that those change management practices are con continuously there to support the team. So 
in the scenario, um, a product modification, we have a, a service delivery, a service set of, of products that are delivered uh, to our clients. And let's say a new product comes in, a new API, a new data set is available to the client. Um, so this means that the product team, the sales reps are available of that, of that product, but now our negotiators, our legal team needs to be involved and understand what that product is so that they can better negotiate during that, during that time. So the change enablement plan becomes apparent. Um, we have to communicate um, first, hey, communicate to all of our stakeholders of their responsibilities. Now this new API is available. It's available for the client starting at this date. And you need to be understand what needs to be negotiated, if anything, or how does it impact your negotiation process when we speak to the clients? Um, then it's training. So is there training involved? Are there scenarios that they should be aware of, uh, particularly within that new product update? Um, is the uh, new data set going to significantly change how they how they uh, the product offering and how they negotiate on specific? agreements, and again, specific agreements could be any of the agreements across the board, but specifically related to that, to that, um, that data set and new product. And then training, as I noted in the book, is, is an important piece. And it's, it's often a, you know, something like you get a, you know, a notification from your company, hey, you need to do this, complete this training by this date. And it's not always like that exciting, right? Or it doesn't really apply to you or, or whatever the case may be. But um, I think training as part of change management is extremely important because you don't want to just hand the baton and say, hey, this is what you're going to do now. It gives an opportunity for your stakeholders to feel engaged and feel that they have the right resources for them to, to complete their job and move on from a BAU perspective based on, based on your project uh, in the right way. So uh, a big part of the notice that, uh, that I've noted in the book is delegating coaching or training champions. Uh, this is something we've done as best practices We've delegated uh, individuals or groups to help train and, and um, administer better ways or, or how to do the, the new process or new change that's been, been enabled through the project. And it just builds out resource. It builds out um, better understanding for what's needing to be done. Um, and it, it brings on that personal level that uh, I think is necessary in, in, in many cases. Um, it's also resources. It includes, you know, uh, documentation and FAQs and um, uh, trainings and demos, modules. So people have the opportunity to see what the changes have a more holistic view of what's being done and, and within the entire project. So they understand the change. They understand um, a better way to to look at uh, what's uh, again what the what the project delivery is, and then transition. Um, many of us know that the change is coming We've involved in training, We've been involved maybe in, in some of the UAT and testing that's been done specifically to this new data product. But when's it happening? When's this API going to be available? When are clients going to have access to do uh, to, to have this new tool as part of their product delivery? So that transition timeline is important and that's linked with communication. Hey, this product is going to be available at set date you now be able to negotiate on this date or those types of things. So the transition plan should hopefully be easy now that you've, you've gone through the proper communication channels, you've communicated in a standardized way, you've provided training, you provided training from coaching and delegated champions. They have resources to reach out to if they have questions or concerns. They maybe ask that champion, hey, when's the transition date? When, when are we going to be able to negotiate on this type of product set? When is that going to be available for the clients? So the transition becomes easy. So I wanted to point out those, those break down those um, key factors to, to the change enablement plan um, for you here, just in that kind of short example about a, a new product modification. Right. Any, any questions? Uh, and if I'm going too long, I'll... I'll... No, no, don't, uh, don't worry. The, um, just, um, I'd, li I'd like to actually um, point you to, um, to a question raised by, by Labo in terms of so how do you ensure that your customers also roll out change management timelessly within the companies during the project? That's a hard one. Um, so great question. I, I think um, in my experience, the, we from the operation side of, of the legal department uh, handle uh, our tools as in, uh, as in Salesforce, some of our system tools. So a lot of technology teams, as well as our own tool that we own for, for contract management um, and that part of it is, is a difficult one. It's, it's constant communication. 
um, with back and forth and understanding when their delivery dates are and, and how that impacts the stakeholder. So it's a hard message to get through. It's something I'm personally still working on and our organization is still working on with, with, with technology and technology from, I know from our organization and some of the other organizations I work with can be, uh, you know, can be uh, in an agile framework can be, you know, working a little bit more uh, on a weekly basis. I know for us, our sprints are a little bit shorter and, and that's how um, you know, they deliver their, um, you know, various updates and things to the, to the tool or the system. So I think you have to be collaborative with them and flexible um, and it's, it's not an easy task. So it's a good question. And uh, if there's anybody out there who has any suggestions or things that I would look for that, but it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing to, um, uh, to work with um, as well. So, um, and then, um, you know, I'll just close out by saying, um, you know, now that you've kind of learned a little bit more about change management it's, and its role within legal project management, um, I want you to remember, uh, you know, uh, when building the change management plan um, and then change enablement, which I just, I just went through, you, you have to remember about measurement. And that's the key output um, as I close this out is that you've delivered that you've, you know, you've looked and, and analyzed your stakeholders, who they are and what their, what their role is in your project. Then you've you know, properly communicated, you've trained, you've transitioned them. And then the, the key then at the end is measuring that, you know, have they adapted to the change? Have they, you know, take on a new process in their BAU? Are they still asking questions two, three months down the line? Are they still having issues? Are you seeing, you know, updates or issues related to your KPIs? And, and so it's important to measure that um, in, at the end. And it's, uh, and, you know, it may not be in full scope of, of your project, but it's important to look back at what's, um, you know, what's in a retrospective form of what's gone well and what's, what hasn't and where you can make improvements in the next project. So I think change measurement is, is very important as an, as a eventual output to what you've done and, and enabled your stakeholders for change during your project delivery. Um, and then uh, I also want to point out, um, you know, the tools and things that I provided in the chapter related to uh, related to the RACI and the, and the stakeholder registry for that, um, for the, for that as a resource. Um, and I did break out the change enablement, uh, in, in a graphic as well. So if you want to take a look at that within the chapter, I can provide that also. Um, but, um, uh, in, in closing, I think, um, not all projects require a grand, uh, change enablement plan. I think you can piecemeal it in certain, in certain scenarios, but it's important to look at all these factors as you, as you build out your scope and, and, and look to deliver a legal project. Um, but that you'll realize in doing so that the value of your project will increase and that unspoken voice of success will help the stakeholders and the organization just by creating that change. Um, in the proper way and allowing people to, to be people and, and, and manage the changes uh, as you deliver a project. Thank you for your insights, your profound insights and sharing this experience with us. Any questions, comments, anything you'd like to add from your own perspective, your personal experience pool? If there's none, I have a question that you certainly have not covered in the chapter. That's the question is, I mean, looking at, and you just mentioned your, your project management office or program management office sitting within your operations team. Do you have a dedicated resource just for change management with that specific skill set, sort of rooted in, in, in communication skills and, and probably also some design skills, also potentially also a legal designer for actually shaping um, sort of the, the, the material required to bridge the gap between legal financial expertise, management speak and so forth? So we, um, I, as in setting it up, I, I, I manage it for the most part. And then I have a, a, a business analyst that I work with and, and we will uh, set up the communications in the standard format. We also have a submission process, which individuals within our organization can submit through SharePoint the, the information that they wanna communicate. And then we work with them to draft and then eventually send out a communication. I see, um, I see another question here in, uh, in the chat. Um, here, CJ, um, is creating playbooks part of your change management plan? If not, what are the challenges that prohibit, um, prohibit you from doing so? 
So we have a we have a process in uh, in for for changing uh, for making changes to the playbook. We have a boilerplate process as well, um, which uh, is similar in form, where we have the legal department request change uh, in through a, ded a dedicated form, and then we, um, as the operations team, will execute that change uh, following approval. And then we'll communicate out that change um, to the playbook, um, and that's and that's in the process right now to be more automated from a playbook perspective. Um, but we make the playbook available to all of our negotiators as they as they uh, negotiate contracts. Um, but it's a it's a moving process, and uh, we've we've hopefully got it pretty lean at this point. Um, for, for folks to be able to make change and uh, communicate that change that's, that's happening. But do you have a playbook for the change management itself? We do not. Um, we uh, we have a couple processes that I've you know laid out and and, and ways we communicate and and, uh, and methodology within the the framework of, of legal project management. But there's no there's no um, you know set uh, set playbook to it. No. So is that a, a, a question of, of like funding, resourcing, or is that, so what would be actually sort of the, uh, the prohibiting or inhibiting actually factor that you would actually consider in that space? I think it's, I think it's resource and um, yeah, it's, uh, I'll admit it, I mean, most of the, the project manager, I'm the, I'm the lone project manager within the department. So um, it's, it's more time and resource. Um, mm. Also, I won't. It's it's a big idea. I've never thought about it. So, yeah, to to quote what we're, why we're here, but yeah, that's a that's a great idea. For the purposes of applying what you just said, I have a question. Um, so you've got stakeholders and sponsors, and sometimes you need to be uh, the ventriloquist, and they need to be the dummy. Um, so, to what extent do you find yourself? writing scripts for them, you know, in effect saying, um, in order to get this message across, it has to come from you, given the constituency you represent. Here's a draft of a communication or talking points that I'd like you or people on your staff to use. Um, to what extent has that been a technique that uh, you've not necessarily deliberately put in your playbook, but used, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, like little tips and tricks. Sure. So um, I mentioned earlier about the standardized um, framework for communication and, and, and specifically targeted communications. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, 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 that framework allows you to communicate in a very standardized way that people understand it. So people know when something has changed, it comes out and they know what to look for. They know, hey, this is the change. Uh, I'm sort of concerned with it, or I am. I know that it directly impacts me based on how we direct the communication, who it's gone to, but also in the, in the details of who, um, uh, what your responsibility is within that change and then who to contact. So if they have questions or concerns, they're able to either contact the operations team and, and, and an example or whoever the, the, the contributor is to the communication. So it's, it's very direct and um, hopefully that standardized framework is, is very clear. I wouldn't say hopefully, it is very clear um, to the stakeholders as to how they are gonna inherit the change and what, you know, what resources they have available to, to facilitate change in their, in their role. Mm. Right. I remember uh, one of my bosses also always saying it's about um, reinforcing that communication message, right? Because once, twice, um, just making sure it always comes through. And then one of my colleagues, Leanne, really just had um, a few great points that she mentioned to me about communicating. So over to you, Leanne. So have you ever experienced, I think, I think it's good to have a standardized message, but at the same time, I think people take in information very differently. So I think having the same message in different forms can be really helpful because some people are really yeah. visual. So infographics, videos, yeah. um, some people really results driven. So you might really hammer home like, if we do this, we're gonna see this, you're gonna get this much back in your day. And then I think some people are maybe a little more old school, but just hopping on the phone and their audio and just really talking mm -hmm. through and easing their mind that way. 
Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, I alluded to it earlier about demos and, and demonstrations. We've we've done uh, we've put that into a standardized form and how we handle those demonstrations, how we document in visual form um, through some of our procedural documents as to as to what the change looks like and how you know side by sides as uh, here's what you're doing today, here's what you're going to do tomorrow. So definitely a, a great point to make uh, on that as well. So conscious of time, I don't want to cut off the, the discussions, obviously, yeah. but nonetheless, I think um, every every single topic deserves actually a decent uh, amount of minutes. Um, so therefore, I mean, uh, not having a communication plan is probably a risk, I suppose. And uh, so therefore, we are very keen to hear from you, Julie and Naomi, um, how you actually look at risk management and the, the, the type of risk management, obviously, that's not linked to the legal matter itself, but rather to the legal service delivery process. And I think um, you with your background as an alternative legal service provider, obviously sort of um, being ahead of the curve and when it comes down to process management, project management, those principles is clearly um, giving you a little bit of an, an, a head start on the topic. Sure, thank you very much, Ignaz, and um, for the opportunity and for having us here to talk about uh, risk management. So I will just very briefly introduce Exigent myself. I'll get Julie to introduce herself, and then we'll take you through um, our experience and how we approach risk management as an alternative legal services provider. Cool. Sure. So um, as you all know, hopefully know who Exigent is, we're a legal consulting and technology provider. We're also an alternative legal services provider in that we work with both law firms and in-house corporates. So we really have a um, diverse perspective in managing projects, whether it is from a collaborating perspective with law firms delivering large-scale projects, or whether it's implementing um, technology projects projects across some of our um, clients' portfolio. And um, that is basically the experience that we have and that we applied in writing the chapter. For myself, I am an attorney, um, or like I call myself a reformed attorney, no longer practicing. I uh, transitioned very quickly into business, um, firstly in um, financial services, asset management. And that's where I had my first experience in managing some large scale projects, either as a acting project manager in some of the projects or uh, working with our project managers in managing enterprise wide projects across multiple jurisdictions. Um, I have then joined Exigent in, in client engagement um, capacity, and I work very closely with the likes of Julie, our marketing team, our delivery team in, in managing client projects or in solutioning um, solutions for our clients. With that, let me hand over to Julie to just um, introduce herself. Thanks, Naomi. Um, hi, everyone. So, as Naomi said, we work together at Exigent. I'm Julie. Um, I've been with Exigent for about seven years now in various um, spectrums on the legal project management front. So starting right as a junior contract reviewer um, through to a senior project manager. Um, and yes, recently I joined what is called our optimization team. And in that team, I lead a team of legal professionals um, that uses our proprietary technology to manage contractual obligations and also, as of last month, um, financial obligations in terms of legal matter management and legal spend management. So my experience covers a lot of project management in various ways, um, and that was my contribution to the chapter for that I co-authored with, with Naomi. So. Um, yeah, I think I'll just hand back to you to go through, through our approach. Sure, thank you, Julie. So how we have approached our chapter was really looking at how you're able to manage risk in a project capacity. I know as legal professionals, as um, project professionals, we always, we understand what risks mean, what the risks mean for the business, and then what it means for um, your project. But what we were really trying to um, 
demonstrate as some practical examples of how we have implemented different risk mitigation strategies across managing your, um, your project risk. So we looked at putting a framework in place. It's understanding. Um, so if you look at a project, it has um, your triple constraint factor. It will either be your budget, your scope, or your time. And one of those factors could be impacted. And if you mitigate the risk on the one, what would it mean for some of the others? And what are some of the constraints that you are able to live with and that you are able to accept within a project? So really starting with understanding what are those constraints that may hinder the successful delivery of your project? And like our CEO, David Holmes, would always say, no risks are equal. So some of them would be a, a lot more detrimental to the success of your project, and the others may not necessarily be detrimental. Some could even be advantageous in the way that you deliver your project. Um, so really just starting off in the beginning of your project, looking at what are some of those potential risks, whether it is internal um, um, resource constraints, and Julie will give you some examples of how we've mitigated some of those risks through our projects. And really just in a methodical method, go through each of those risks that could impact it. And it, it goes right back to your stakeholder um, engagement, understanding who your stakeholders are, engaging with them around what some of those risks may be, and the way we do it, and that's um, one of the great um, advantages of being at Exigen, as we even start preparing a brief for a client or engaging with the client, we start understanding what could impact this project. And we put that in our plan from the time that we submit a proposal to a client, really understanding how this could affect some of um, the delivery of the project. So um, how we have worked with some law firms and how one of the mitigating factors that you could apply in um, risk management is a shared risk model. So you do not have to take all the risk. You can share that with other a third party. Some of it could be in an agreement. You can share some of your risk by agreements. One of the models that we have is an alternative re, um, resource model. And I will literally just take you through some examples of how law firms firms have engaged the shared um, risk model with Exigent. So to that point, I think the best way to just cover that is to talk about one of our practical experiences and one online. Um, this is a project that we managed in 2017 um, and it was a M&A due diligence support project. So because we are an alternative legal services provider, obviously we do not form part of the legal advisory team. Um, but as most projects go, the sort of real pressure points and, and areas where we needed to mitigate risk for our clients was timeline, uh, volume of the in-scope agreements that we needed to review and budget, of course. So it was that, you know, a triple threat in, in the sense of, of risk. Um, so, long story short, our, our client um, was disposing of a portion of its business, um, and they sort of needed to turn that project around in three weeks. So, if you have a, a, a client coming to you saying, look, I need 300 commercial arrangements agreements reviewed in three weeks, that sort of makes your heart palpitate a little bit. Um, and so, we kind of needed to be creative in the way that we approached it. Um, our clients obviously had their preferred legal advisors who would be working on, on the project, but it was a small uh, niche law firm, commercial law firm, and the concern there really was that they would not have the capacity to turn around all, all the contract review that was required for, for the disposal. Um, our client, obviously, at that point, we had been supporting the client with sort of a low risk contract review as an extension of the in-house legal team. 
Um, and obviously having understanding, having had an understanding of what Exigen does and how we operate within, um, especially the South African market, they approached us to be a collaborator on this project. So with much resistance and to the point of change management that was made earlier, um, we sort of had to get the law firm on board so that this could be an exit. So that was one of the key risks that we had to mitigate. It's just helping the law firm understand where we, what our perspective is as an alternative legal services provider, um, that we're not a threat to the available hour. Um, our clients actually, the clients, the clients expectations actually still completed all of that. So we managed to get there eventually with, with the law firm and with exigent, um, and I'm sure many other alternative legal services providers have the same sort of resourcing methodology. Um, we've got a database of lawyers who have been with Exigent over a number of years, but not on a permanent basis. So they sort of recontract them for different projects and let them um, explore other areas of their career when, when, when the project ends, of course. Um, so fortunately for this project that I speak of, it was called Project Leader, um, we could dip into that resource pool and sort of quickly get some about 50 commercial um, lawyers together to just help the law firm collaborate on the project, turn around the contract review to be able to um, see the disposal through to the end. So, I mean, there's a lot more detail to this um, case study in, in our chapter. Um, but we were able to turn it around within the three weeks with very little sleep, of course. Um, I think we also managed to gain a good relationship and partnership with the law firm um, that we worked with. And obviously, the biggest concern with any project is your budget. And we managed to sort of save our, our client quite a bit of money. So um, I, I found it quite interesting when Christopher was speaking about change management earlier a lot of uh, the success of this project and part of the risk mitigation strategy was change management. Um, when you're dealing with a small law firm that, you know, obviously really relies on, on, on the work that, that we were sharing with them, um, it, it, it was really, really important to sort of mitigate that initial risk of engaging an alternative legal services provider. So yeah, I, I hope that covers um, everything you need to nail me. But but how? Sorry if I may interrupt. How did you actually mitigate the risk? Did you bring them on site? Did you show them around how you operate so with actually, the open space offices, or did you give them actually a session on on how processes work, actually playbooks? So what was exactly. the actual uh, contribution to the to the process? So for this project, um, we have a, our project teams are based in Cape Town, for those of you who are familiar with, with South Africa, um, and our client is based in Johannesburg. So what we had done was we sent a team, a small part of our team, um, with my co-project manager to Johannesburg to sort of meet with the law firm, meet with the investment bankers, and just sort of explain how the collaboration would work. Um, that took a few sessions. Obviously, there was various concerns around scope management, um, actually allocating work to us as the alternative legal services provider. Um, and so we sort of just managed that with various of discussions, um, including our clients in all of them, of course, um, just to drive that point home that it was not about us and them and that there was a common goal, which was delivering um, successfully for our clients. And um, we also definitely made use of um, engagement letters and, and those types of agreements just to manage scope and to give the law firm some peace of mind that um, they would still have control over the advisory component of, of the review. All right, thank you. Yeah, just to add to that, Ignace, it's definitely um, continuous engagement, um, not only with the law firm, but also with the client and being able to provide comfort around um, some of also the security mechanism, because often um, what you'd have um, clients 
or the law firms being concerned about is the privacy of the data um, having serving so many different clients. So how are you able to deliver a project and still maintain some of the confidentiality? So having some of your iOS um, certifications in place, um, having um, the team meets with um, the law firms having um, and um, one of the one of the way strategies that we employ as well is continuous data analytics for our clients so as the teams are going through the review process the uh, both the client and the law firm has got um, almost a real-time access to understand how we are tracking what are some of the issues that are coming up so that the client can then proactively or the law firm can then proactively um, step in and uh, see, oh, there is, a, there is a potential problem if this is a potential um, M&A transaction and how are we going to manage this so that it doesn't impact the uh, longevity or the timelines of those particular projects. So does anyone have um, any comments at this point, how you maybe have engaged with the ALSP or um, alternative providers and some of the risks that you have found that may be um, highlighted through that process? Please feel free, just unmute yourself, jump in, make a comment. So one of the other um, one of the other things that I wanted to mention that we cover in our um, chapter is around how risk management in a project capacity is continuous. Um, finding um, or spending a significant amount of time on risk management at the um, inception of the project is critical. Engaging with uh, your stakeholders, um, with uh, the project team, um, with um, extended stakeholders or how this will um, impact the project is important, but that is not the only time in which risk management needs to be applied across a project. Um, as we have seen, as we deliver or as we reach different milestones, there are different risks that comes across that um, some new, some is existing risks that now have become um, that have become bigger risks that may have a larger impact on the project, or some of the risks could really be taken off from the risk register. So scheduling um, regular milestones in which you look at your risk and, and um, engage is one of the ways in which you can ensure a successful delivery of, um, your, legal, uh, of your legal project. So with that being said, um, some strategies in which um, you can mitigate the risk, you can either just avoid some of the risks because they are, you know, you, uh, you have contingencies in place. Um, it, it may not be big enough that impact the um, full scope of your project. You can accept the risk. Um, we all understand that the um, remote staffing right now during COVID is probably a risk that each one of us has had to deal with. We've accepted that risk. We've put uh, mitigations in place that it will be delivered. Um, you understand how you're going to track whether your team members, whether the project team is delivering according to it, or you can transfer the risk. And that was one of the examples that Julie has, um, has mentioned. Just one other the example where a, a corporate has um, worked with Exigen in terms of transferring their risk. It was a large Asian uh, construction company that had a um, large amount of data. I think it was over 3 million documents in which they needed to submit a report to the um, to their governing authorities within a couple of weeks. And if, if the legal team or even any of the team members within the business had to spend time finding the solution or finding um, what they need to submit to the authorities within the three um, week period, they would never have met the time or even the budget if they had to outsource that to maybe a law firm to really just be able to do an e-discovery for them across all of that um, document review. We have then Exigence uh, legal team has put together a um, 
a discovery project team understood what are some of the deliverables, what are the key search terms that they required in uh, through that project. And in that way, we were able to deliver within budget, within scope and meet the timelines that this client really needed a delivery. So it's not always working with a um, external law firm, but it's also working with internal um, in-house legal teams that may have large-scale projects and not knowing how they can really mitigate some of the risks that they could have um, within their projects. Um, I, have Julie, a, I have a quick question, sorry. So I, I, before I jump, but as um, uh, we've been uh, within my organization, there's been a lot about uh, risk tracking and having a, a, a document basically that's a risk tracker. Um, and as part of that, we've, we've identified risks and, you know, and as you mentioned, laid out a mitigation strategy. Do you guys ever look at likelihood, right? And then how, what's the likelihood of that risk ever happening? You know, what's the likelihood of, you know, us being all remote, right? Uh, you know, there has to be some kind of COVID-19 or something, you know, but I guess the, the question is, is that something you've uh, looked at and, and identified as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, we've definitely looked at it. So it's it's the likelihood and the probability of that happening. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've touched on that in our chapter. We probably didn't go into too much details, understanding that we are speaking to a more legal project team. Um, you could... Um, just uh, researching and understanding how to uh, quantify some of those risks, you can get down into a real spiral around it. But that's absolutely, I think um, I alluded to it in the beginning, understanding. So you assess your risk, you, you have your risk register, and then you assess what's the likelihood of this happening, what's the velocity of it. And based mm -hmm. on that, you then um, risk rate, which of those risks you're going to prioritize and you're going to have to um, focus your time on because if a, a risk of a I mean, uh, what could happen in South Africa? Most probably an earthquake is like it's likely to happen because a small one happened in Cape Town. But what, how likely is it? Probably 0.001%. And it will mm -hmm. not uh, impact our staff or them having access to the internet to deliver it. And um, so it's really just finding the risk that would materially impact your project and that would um, that would hinder a successful delivery of it that you focus on. Absolutely, that's great, thank you. I, I'd like to read more about it as well too, so thank you. And I do Absolutely. have to jump, thank you everyone. And we thank look you. forward to read your chapter too. Yes, Cheers, thank Christopher. you. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Christopher. Julia, I don't know if you have anything that you want to jump in here or add before we continue. I think maybe just to add, um, one of the key things that we use at Exigent, which I don't think is unique to Exigent, is um, looking at latent learned um, reports. So with every closeout procedure, we sort of look at our project, understand what have we done, what have we accomplished, what could have been processed better. And on that basis, because we are a, an AOSP, our scope is usually very similar across the various projects that we deliver. So it becomes a little easier to Christopher's point um, just now to sort of plan ahead for those kinds of risks and understanding what is likely to happen and what's not likely to happen. Yeah, absolutely. There is um, there is so much value in um, your historical data um, because that really helps you, number one, identify which are some of those risks that you need to focus on going forward or how you have dealt with it. Was it successful? Was it uh, margin not successful? And how are we able to implement that? And we also get that cross collaboration from our project teams um, because sometimes when we we do need to scale up, you'd find that our lawyers from our technology and optimization team works across the commercial team and being able to really just overlay some of their best practices in how they've dealt with a much longer term project because our technology projects are really um, 
not overnight implementing a technology for a large corporation that has um, multiple business units or uh, multiple subsidiaries is a vastly different project and has very different risks that impact that project compared to working with a high value um, M&A transaction project, for example. And what we have done as well, I don't know if Labo is still on the call, but we have we have for our chapter, we've even engaged with other project managers that has worked within corporates collaborating with technology providers on how they've managed some of their technology implementation risks. And you'd always find that scope creep in those kind of projects become um, very likely to occur. Labo, if you are still here, I don't know if you want to just add um, a few words around how you've mitigated some of your risks. There you are. Hi there. You can just unmute yourself. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I just put in a comment on the chats just now with regards to stakeholder management. And uh, and that goes with the point that I, I said earlier on. I think uh, Sebastian was still presenting at the time. Um, what normally happens is that when we don't get our stakeholders involved right at the beginning, I mean, from the time the concept is actually approved, we, we're not able to identify risks. And so what happens mostly is that eventually the stakeholders get identified during planning, which is already too late. And they come with a, a whole host of risks that would not have been identified or by a group that was present when the business case was being drafted. And so you end up with a lot of scope creep that wasn't actually um, included in your contingency plans. And so we found that getting a broader team involved right at the onset works out better to minimize risk and they can take accountability for some of the mitigation um, actions that come up during the planning sessions. I hope that helps anyone. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and we have um, obviously covered this as well. We've laid out some of the steps as to how you start with identifying your risk. So you're going to end up with a grocery list and that is okay, but it's how you work through that grocery list to really just break it down to what are those critical factors that would, that would impact it. I think just in, in parting words, I would say that risk management may seem like um, just a term, but it, if something goes wrong within your project and a risk that hasn't been identified or scoped, it could derail the entire um, project. And and risk mitigation or risk management flows from the beginning and through all the elements that every portion of the project that has been um, discussed, whether it's from scoping right through to the closing of your project, there's an element of risk management and just understanding that how you incorporate it and how you identify it and seeing it as a critical element rather than a tick box approach to implementing a project. We could go on for a long, long time discussing that topic. And uh, thank you so much, um, Naomi and, and Julie, for, for actually sharing those insights with us. And in particular, I mean, one of the things um, we've discussed earlier and, and um, Helga spoke about it last time was the differences between the way we approach legal project management, the whole meta life cycle. Um, and that also informs the way we, we actually tackle certain topics such as risk management, stakeholder analysis, and so forth. And obviously, I mean, they, they, at some stage, there will be convergence um, between traditional law firms, those law firms in transition, like Baker, McKenzie, and others, and, 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 and the sort of the pure play, new kids on the block, the alternative legal service providers who don't, who have not buckled up actually for 100 years of actually history yet, and are still on their way, but come up with a, a sort of very fresh approach, basically, a um, starting from from nowhere and and putting something very different into place um, in place and the so that's i think where, where we can all learn from each other not across geographies not only but also across the different types of actually service delivery models that we have actually um that we see actually in this 
in this audience. So there's there's more to be discussed. Uh, funny enough, one one little actually anecdote. I just actually conducted training with a large actually firm a couple of days ago, and one of the feedback um, or the the snippets actually that that were shared with me as feedback were like, "Why are we discussing stakeholder management, risk management? It's all common sense." You know, it's, it's being sort of inflated to some sort of pseudo um, scientific approach. Why are we um, discussing that at all? And I, you know, my, my sort of response was, yes, it may be common sense. Some, sometimes common sense seems to be actually a rare, actually, skill. And, you know, if you even add some structure to it, as, as you just did, um, the, the two of you, that's actually where you turn it into something useful and, and immediately beneficial to each project. But, you know... Um, and that's that's a change process in the legal profession, actually, explaining that common sense as such may not be present all the time. So you need to actually manifest some of these insights. Yeah. And uh, that takes me straight into our next topic. Um, Sebastian and Yasmin, um, how can we actually apply legal design thinking, which is sort of actually taking a completely different look at what we have and actually... Um, how is that actually taking us then into legal project management? So over to you guys and really looking forward to your insights. Many thanks. Uh, many thanks, Ignas. Uh, many thanks for the presenters that presented uh, just, uh, just right now and during the last meetings. Um, really, really great insights into the different topics. Um, actually, Christopher's uh, comments earlier on um, <laughs> almost... Uh, yeah, uh, in, a, in a very um, yeah, good way uh, led into our topic um, or are leading in our, into our topic. And um, well, the focus of both our experiences does not lie in the regular uh, legal project management approach. Um, nevertheless, uh, well, I'm at Baker McKenzie, a product developer. Um, so working for the global service design team there and the innovation legal tech team have all kinds of, um, yeah, uh, tasks to do together with Yasmin and um, worked in different positions and industries, um, startups, which basically all require project management basics. However, I would not call myself an expert per se. Uh, over to Yasmin. Yeah, thank you. Um, so very interesting topics and very interesting insights. So I'm working for reInvent Law. It's an innovation hub as innovation manager and yeah, I previously worked as a legal project management assistant for, for Baker McKenzie, but I also would not name myself an expert at all um, in the field of legal project management. So um, the question was, uh, how do we come from yeah, legal design or legal design thinking to legal project management? So, um, and why contributing in an, a chapter for legal project management? So uh, this is what we are going to uh, what we are going to talking about uh, the next uh, few minutes. So um, our idea lies in our experience we made with a new kind of project, the so-called innovation project. So um, we all know that the legal market is running um, through a lot of changes and uh, the delivery of valuable legal services has changed in the past 10 years. And that created significant competition and pricing pressure among the legal market that leads to an increased demand for cost efficient fulfillment of the client's needs. So we know that the drivers are technologies and processes and also the access to institutional capital and um, the client demand for enhanced value as well as changes in other professional service industry delivery models uh, we discovered a few minutes ago. So um, I think uh, at this point, uh, we should have a deeper dive into the so-called innovation project and uh, talking about the specifications, because we should be aware that uh, they differ from a regular project approach. And uh, yeah, and uh, this is... Uh, what, what, uh, why we um, contributed this chapter that there are, yeah, not only one kind of project or one approach to pro uh, project management, there are also um, other ways to do it. And um, so the stakeholders expectation regarding results in such projects are much higher than in other type of projects while the risk of failure of those innovation projects is uh, significant. Um, so we also experienced that the scope of work, uh, if there's any scope of work, uh, is rather difficult to define. And also uh, the details are yeah, 
quite impossible to define in advance uh, of the planning phase. So um, as uh, already mentioned in the beginning, this project often operate in a turbulent and dynamic environment. So I think part of it, uh, uh, we, we experience part of it uh, in the legal system at the moment. And uh, yeah, um, so that's we, where we are in. And um, I think you see maybe, um, yeah, the picture in the back of us. So we don't, <laughs> we yeah, don't yeah, work. Everybody with, with... applauded already. I mean, in, <laughs> yeah. in the chat. So yeah. Fantastic. So, um, so we don't work with slides. We, we uh, use the background um, and, <laughs> and yeah, just ahead. So um, I think I don't have to mention how um, the, the traditional waterfall uh, diagram or how it looks like. Um, it's, it's very beautiful, but what we are trying to visualize here in the back is, um, so, um, show, so it shows the workflow of a regular innovation project. Um, you see there is no um, workflow at all. And um, yeah, we're trying to visualize um, that uh, problems in those in, uh, in innovation project are initially poorly structured and um, neither technology nor customer requirements are uh, necessarily known or predefined at the outset. So as you can imagine, or maybe um, already experienced um, by yourself um, is that um, when you compare those pictures and or uh, those visualizations, um, it's maybe clear or um, visible uh, from the structure of this project that the previous approach might have its challenges. And I think, um, Seb, you can give more insights into those challenges and yeah, tell our audience more about it. Absolutely. Um, so thanks for thanks for that introduction. And um, as as the presenters just mentioned, I mean, uh, talking about communication when Anna Katarina is going to talk about that, it's it's an essential topic. I mean, all this is getting together, and um, all this is obviously as well um, a topic um, in uh, legal design and and the yeah symbiosis um, within uh, legal project management. Um, speaking of or getting back to the to the limitations and challenges, um, well, the first limitation basically emphasizes on the importance of an exploration phase in the projects themselves. So um, the requirements and specifications can emerge through learning and through experimentation. The second limitation um, emphasizes on the critical and essential role of the stakeholders, the users, and the need to mobilize them to build the context in which the project will be developed. Um, and we will obviously give certain uh, examples later on. Um, third limitation has really underlined the need to link legal project management to a fixed strategy, for example, by replacing the project management part um, within the broader concept of knowledge creation uh, with a multi-project portfolio approach. Um, and yeah, I mean, um, Resulting from this overall, uh, the L uh, LPM is uh, in this context moving towards an approach that is uh, much more creative um, and open-ended uh, as, as Christopher as well already told us uh, much earlier on. Um, and uh, this really marks the point where uh, yeah, legal design thinking can provide a path to avoid or um, to improve those challenges basically. And uh, some of you yeah, may, uh, may, may already have heard of that um, legal design or design thinking approach. Um, I see as well some familiar faces here. Hi, Achim. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, um, we nevertheless want to give a little high fly um, and I'm handing over to Yasmin with that. Yeah, so, um, so what is uh, design thinking? Or yeah, let's talk about uh, this, this uh, yeah. This topic. So innovation, uh, design thinking is an innovation approach and it's um, yeah, focusing on the humans within the legal system. So that means so legal only means that it uh, takes place in the, in the legal market or in the legal field. So um, it, um, yeah, it, it helps to understand where the crucial breakdowns in the system uh, right now exist and um, yeah, helps to make a, uh, the creative leap to define uh, what a better system might be. Um, as already mentioned, it uh, combines the lawyer's expertise with, with a designer's expect, uh, expertise. So it's, it's uh, a designer's um, approach and mindset, um, and it helps to create a legal system services and also processes, um, supports educational programs and environments, um, 
uh, that are more useful and usable and understandable and engaging for all. So um, the set the user is um, in the center of the attention and um, just to yeah uh, just to focus on that. So it's all about the user. So it's very customer centric and um, that's one of the main points of um, design thinking. So compared to the traditional um, uh, approach, it opposed linear and analytical problem solving approaches, so um, which are likely to fail to solve um, evil problems we mentioned in the beginning, uh, which are lacking um, both the final formulation and solutions and are characterized by high uncertainty and um, ambiguity. So um, also to mention, I think, um, is that legal design is uh, hypothesis driven. That means um, you, you start with a, the, the, the journey with a, with a hypothesis and um, yeah, this process presents both a problem and a solution. And also one of the main point is um, it is, uh, it iterates relentlessly. That means uh, you go through the phases, um, you go back and forth and you learn by um, yeah, experimentating and um, yeah, just uh, trying around. Absolutely. I mean, um, and as, as, Yasmin, as Yasmin just mentioned, and as we see in the back here, like uh, there's, there's lots of stuff going on in the back there and the goal is not even defined. So um, we, we experienced uh, these things in, in, in all kinds of projects now, having worked uh, together for the last, I think, almost four years now. And um, it's been a, a good couple of projects that we've been uh, yeah, collaborating basically um, when she was with Bakers, when, when uh, she shifted over to reInvent. Um, and yeah, I mean, um, speaking of uh, the process itself, um, just to, to, to conclude there, it's about um, empathize, uh, define, ideate, prototype and test in order to then validate and um, yeah, speaking of the contribution of legal design itself, um, remember the, the first limitation that I was uh, talking about earlier on, um, the exploration phase itself, uh, using this uh, rather iterative approach may lead to better requirements and specifications um, compared to that uh, kind of business approach, um, problem to solution, you go to problem to specific problem to then to a specific solution. So that is that makes really the difference and um, promotes specifically that learning trial and erroring type of um, yeah, uh, 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 attitude there. Um, by focusing on it learning, identifying hypotheses and artic articulating the problem before seeking the solutions and by emphasizing the experimentation, legal design really can contribute to the explorative dimension of projects. The tools which support um, the in-depth data collection and idea generation encourage managers to, to work with multiple options in the end of the day. And um, that is pretty much generating, evaluating the multiple hypotheses that are there converting multiple solutions into active testing. Um, and I'm just gonna pause there for a second. Uh, second limitation is basically um, the stakeholder management. So thinking about the user, we have a user centric approach there mm -hmm. and um, the identification and involvement of the relevant stakeholders in the upstream phase is really crucial and uh, absolutely essential um, as well when we talk about this complexity in the back there. I mean, not that regular project uh, management approach type of projects are not as complex, but as said, here we don't even have a proper target, so to speak, right? And I'm going back to that uh, at a later stage. Um, so yeah, legal design also encourages collaborating with a multidisciplinary team. Um, this really helps uh, developing a broader understanding of the problem, bringing diverse minds to one table, encouraging the symbiosis of the different, you know, experiences and so on and so forth, uh, such as such as we are here on this call. Um, and uh, yeah, through leveraging this uh, rapid prototyping, um, having demonstrators, having something tangible, you really um, enable an effective dialogue um, with the user, with the stakeholder and a comprehension that, that really uncovers uh, insights and unspoken needs and expectations of the stakeholders. Getting back to the third limitation, and um, I'm not going to talk too much longer. Um, the third limitation emphasizes on the lack of the broader 
perspective or rather lacking the broader perspective on the strategic issues um, legal design can provide, and, and that's again just uh, an in invitation, so to speak, can provide contribution on, on this or in this perspective. Um, this provides a method for, for gaining knowledge about the strategic direction, um, for example, for needs, insights, inspiration. You really have to imagine traveling with a compass, but there are no directions, no indication whatsoever. Um, and yeah, this uh, approach complements the traditional Analytic, analytical and functional perspective of um, legal project management, um, basically by emphasizing the importance of an innovative project. And um, in this way, it makes it really essential uh, contribution to a strategy orientation and formulation, which uh, was what I uh, basically mentioned earlier on, encouraging the symbiosis of both methods. And um, just to um, pause there for a second, um, I, will, I will give you a little example there. We are currently working on several change management topics and um, we, we basically have some kind of, a, well, it turned out to be a mixed method approach. It was not a planned one. Nevertheless, um, we are really making use of um, the yeah, traditional old school, so to speak, um, project management uh, uh, methodology. Uh, nevertheless, as well, taking iterations into consideration, which is so important because working with, um, with a couple of uh, associates on our side, we at some point found out that this tech project and we entirely planned it out, you know, proper project plan and so on, um, finalization dates, um, scaling updates and so on and so forth, testing, prototyping, piloting, whatsoever, then doing an iteration and finding out, okay, there is actually a shift from a tech-driven approach and tech-driven project towards a change management project. And it's much rather making use of the technology that we already have because we tested it and we couldn't validate it because users did not really appreciate what we did there. And um, finding out, okay, hang on, actually we've got to move on um, with what we have, uh, optimizing this, making it um, more intuitive, better understandable whatsoever, and um, really having this, uh, you know, symbiosis when making use of this iterative um, uh, circle, so to speak, with the traditional project management approach. And obviously, then for the learnings, and I'm, I'm going to end my sentence with this, um, for the learnings afterwards, we are obviously as well um, noting down all the, you know, um, periods that we are, that we are uh, yeah, making use of, that we are um, working in and uh, really have a proper um, plan in the end of the day uh, for future projects. Going to pause there, opening the discussion. Um, and yeah, thanks for, thanks for listening. Thank you so much to the two of you. Um, I think maybe one, one, one point uh, we should not leave um, unmentioned is that, um, so we maybe an, an, an add-on or yeah, uh, just to um, give some insights into reality. So we don't uh, think that, of course, legal design thinking is a one-fits-all approach. Um, what we Absolutely. wanted to, to um, yeah, we, we, the main thing is that um, we must be aware of the um, project and what environment we are in. So this is one, uh, yeah, um, main point uh, why we um, contributed this, this um, chapter. And um, you should be also aware of the correspondent limitation and how to figure them out. And also, uh, we should not leave unmentioned that um, it is not the only So oh, did we lose her? I think we just uh, a risk materialized. Then, so to speak. Um, yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. You're, you're back. Good. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No worries, no worries. Yeah, but, we, but we, thanks we, for this. Could you, uh, could you um, please repeat your, your last sentence? Second. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I just year. wanted to... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know why what's happening here, but it's Vodafone, so... <laughs> <laughs> and in German, digitization, so I don't have to <laughs> uh, talk uh, more about it. So, um, so what I wanted to also to mention is there are a lot of um, agile approaches um, which can help in other, um, yeah, project phases or with other challenges, but these are the challenges we saw uh, uh, or we experienced uh, legal design can um, contribute something for legal project management.
Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for this uh, conclusion, Yasmina. I almost forgot our most important point in the end there, opening up for the discussion. <laughs> thanks for thanks for concluding. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Cheers. Any comments, questions, or experiences you've you've had in the past? I mean, some of you obviously. I mean, looking at you, Marion, you you obviously gained um, significant experience in in sort of. Um, alternative approaches to, to project management also from a um, sort of um, behavioral aspect with your leadership trainings and so forth. It's difficult to teach people to do things in a better way. Hmm. You know, you, you probably know this great cartoon from the Harvard Business Review with the people pushing with the, the, yeah. car, with the square wheels and there's this guy with a okay. round wheel. Look what I discovered. No, thanks. We're too busy. That, that applies for legal project management. That applies even more for legal design because it's even more unfamiliar to, to the way lawyers think. They have a hard time recognizing the great power in, in legal design. That's my experience. But we're all chipping away at it. I guess we all experienced that. Um, yeah. The I, one thing I was wondering, actually, when when um, uh, when reading a, a chapter, I mean, and and sort of leveraging my privilege in that regard, the. The, the, the aspect about empathy and, and sort of empathizing at a very early stage and, and trying to put the, the client at the, at the center of what you're trying to achieve. I mean, that's the core of the legal profession, right? So, so how can that be different in the traditional approach compared to legal design? Shouldn't that actually be the same? And also when, when you look at the, the ways you actually start a legal design session by actually having an icebreaker, getting people to connect and making sure everybody in the room is actually contributing and not actually driving a, a, a hierarchy of, of like um, stakeholders where, where there's one actually speaking or the other is listening, no actually sharing of ideas and, and, and contributions or mutually um, contributing actually to all these aspects. So what's your take on that? I mean, there's a disconnect between here because traditionally lawyers, when, 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 and I'm one myself, so I should not say they, I should say we, when we focus on the client, we focus on the in-house lawyer who has given us the work and will pay our bills, or we are focusing on the judge that will read our drafts. We never focus on the real user. And the real users are the poor people that have to live our agreements, that have to read and understand our policies. So there's a real disconnect that legal design can help to, to, to correct, to focus on the user and to put empathy and humanity back into the stuff we write and the stuff we speak. Uh, I, I totally agree with that. So what we experienced, for example, is uh, exactly what you mentioned, Marion, um, is uh, that when you start a project and you get, uh, yeah, you have the, the challenge or uh, you have to start, uh, you, you have to, um, yeah, do the project phases, um, you only ask um yeah, for example, the in-house council. So, what is the project all about? But at least it, um, yeah, it touches also uh, the executive board and not only the in-house council. Because for an M&A transaction, um, it, it, uh, it's 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 almost the whole company um, and not only the legal council. He, the general counsel, he he um, leads this project, but. Um, all the, the, the stuff coming out of that, all the documents, all, yeah, so also the, the financial aspects um, are coming to the executive board. And, and this, is, this is the user and not the general counsel. So that, that is why um, legal design can, yeah, support with that and maybe um, give, give more, yeah, um, guidance on that um, to ask more who, who will get uh, the results of all that we are working for. Yeah. 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 
Absolutely. I have a question around how did you get adoption or really um, have the lawyers start adopting legal design and looking at from a human centric position because I find that it is so hard to to have that change management to like you know this is going to make it easier so how did you what uh, strategies did you employ for it basically um and uh Yasmin happily to uh to share that with you yeah. um we've done we've done many workshops together um as as mentioned earlier on we've been working together for four years and back then, this was really some pioneering type of uh, stuff. I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've done design thinking um, in, in my uh, old job in renewables and um, before that in specialty chemicals. Nevertheless, I think um, it, yeah, like it really kicked off in the, in the legal environment just a, uh, probably a decade ago and, um, and, and is still a, a trend and still ongoing. And um, to, to really get back to your question, then that's just my feeling and just mean happy to um, to hear you there as well. Um, it's it's really the, the early adopters and, and willing candidates that you have amongst the partnership um, and associates, well, attorneys in the end of the day that um, see the benefits in doing stuff differently. Let's put it just like that. And um, then they promote basically your, let's say product or, or workshops or whatsoever internally and say like, hey, look, we did it entirely differently. We had a totally different approach. We all sat on one table, had different minds contributing to the entire session. And this is our outcome and this is how it worked like, and it's measurable in the end of the day. And um, this is basically just from my perspective, how we succeeded with all this, um, really getting more and more adopters on board <laughs> being promoted internally. Yeah, I agree. Find ambassadors. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we had the ambassadors and we started with small steps, really small steps. Um, and uh, also it, take a, it took us a lot of time just to yeah um, customize all those workshops um, because there are a lot of topics and yeah, without customization, um, you can't get through the workshops and um, you have to talk a lot about uh, what uh, yeah advantages you will have and yeah a lot of communication and yeah absolutely if i may add a simple way of actually dealing with it naomi is by simply inviting the customer over after you finished actually your meta or whatever it was actually your project and have them actually talk about an experience that is not a little bit but much better than before and that applies to, to all the things that you may actually change from simple, just introducing LPM to, to actually running a pure play legal design process. At the end of the day, if they come back in and sit in your office and tell you, look, it's been so much better now, that's what, what matters. And this is something that you can't dispute anymore. So the client's voice, and we don't yeah. do this not often enough, actually inviting them over and actually listening to them. So to, today we don't have any in-house people, but if you, if you talk to, to some of the in-house um, council, I mean, the, the number of calls they get, um, somebody inviting them over and just actually listening is, is not actually high enough. Yeah. So and that actually, that actually, sorry, Yasmin, go ahead. I will, I will. No, what I wanted to um, add is that uh, what we experienced uh, with those early adopters who, uh, who invited also clients, the clients were overwhelmed and they were really impressed by doing things um, not the traditional way. They were really impressed that they were in the focus or in the center of the attention and um, that uh, the, the, the um, uh, associates were just um, asking them what they need. Um, and that, that's uh, where the, the associates said, okay, it works, it works. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I just wanted to say this, this so much uh, leads over to Anna Katarina's uh, session um, because I mean, communication and and collaboration is such a such a big thing there. And um, Yasmin and I have been like I think we haven't seen each other properly, like physically, for almost a year now. Um, but uh, just to share some, and probably most of you know this, anyways. But we are working on a on a real time board call, called Miro, and um, that really allows us to you know together with users with 
stakeholders, um, with associates and, and whatso whatsoever um, to contribute on several projects, getting their input directly, not mm. waiting for chunks of emails and so on and so forth, and directly test, validate, get feedback and so on. And um, this, this really allows us, uh, a, let's say, a, a, a frequent and, and good way of communicating with each other, of presenting all these different um, aspects and, and facets to, to each other. Um, in these in these kind of uncertain, innovative, uh, innovation-driven projects. And now imagine, and and I, I can talk from experience. I just introduced Myro for LPM training with a law firm. They were initially, after they found their feet in terms of the functionality, they were blown away. That sort of created in this remote space a very different sense of interaction and 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 sort of communication, collaboration, even. And that's. Uh, yeah, the um, thanks for the punt, by the way, Sebastian. I mean, leaving um, leaving me actually with the bridge that I would like to cross and and sort of um, announce what's what's going to happen in the next session with Anna, um, actually talking about communication across the legal service delivery and and sharing a number of insights. Um, as I say, um, I, I should not say this too often, but I was also privileged to to read that chapter as as, as one of the first people and. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to that session. And followed, we, we spoke a lot about um, about communication today. And and David um, uh, David Skinner will talk about uh, client listening, something that that was actually on Vogue um, about 15 years ago. And I remember we've done tons of those client listening exercises. Probably not as good as we should have done it because there was not a lot of action that followed. Um, um, subsequent to any any of those interviews conducted, and and then it sort of actually ceased to exist in these days. If you go back to law firms, it's sort of actually uh, it's a little bit of a renaissance um, happening. Um, it's being sort of rediscovered, and and David Skinner will talk about that actually from his experience, and then we'll see um, Carol Valencia talking about teams with purpose which is obviously also something that we need to look at with all the, the innovative approaches we've discussed today and the communication line. So she will actually share a couple of insights and, and uh, um, I'm looking forward to that session. So for today, I'd like to thank all of you. I mean, please share your, your actual backdrop. I mean, uh, <laughs> so we'll be, um, as you may have seen, we, um, over, if I could, can get a, a few more colleagues actually to work on the website, we'll also actually sort of set up a, a, a resource space and, and at a space with all the links to the recordings. But we've done that already on YouTube. So it, it's gonna be over there um, for sharing and, and watching at night, if you have sleepless nights, I mean, that's not my favorite actually medication, but you know, <laughs> it's, if, if someone is actually keen to do that, I mean, you're more than happy actually to, to do so. And, um, and we'll, we'll continue um, our little road um, or uh, almost, yeah, the road movie through um, all the different corners of, of legal project management. And Today was fabulous because it sort of also shed some light on, on the things that we either don't like to discuss because we don't feel at ease, like risk management, um, change management stuff that it seems to be far away, a little bit of a like an esoteric actually touch to some lawyers. And, you know, it's all about also the, the soft aspects of it, but very crucial in terms of success. Then ultimately, actually, the two of you actually taking us down the road to, to legal design and then also a very different way of looking actually a, a legal service delivery flow, if you like. And um, so thank you for that. As usual, I wish you all actually a, a great evening or good morning, depending on wherever you're at. Um, for some of us, I wish us actually a warm, a warm, um, yeah, next 12 hours. Others actually benefit from Lots of sunshine already. Naomi, you and Judy, you're privileged in that regard. So, yeah, send some sunbeams over to us because it's pretty cold. I just saw as temperatures dropping close to zero now at the moment. And um, keep well in uh, COVID 19 times and, and stay safe wherever you are. So, thanks for joining. Hey, thanks. All the best. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you everyone. sunshine. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Stay healthy. Thank you.